What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to the Struggle to Strength podcast, your source for real life application on how to turn your struggles into strengths in all things mind, muscle, and money. I mean, I guess to, to kind of dive in a little bit, like I think oftentimes we're told that we have to find a niche and that we have to stick to our niche. And if we want to be successful in something, we have to become a master at it and we have to develop our just our ability to perform in that niche, but then you come along and Travis and I agree with this. And maybe it's like an ADD thing on my part. Like I have trouble focusing. I do a bunch of different things and I'm interested in a bunch of different things, but you come along and you're like, you don't really need a niche. Like you can be successful without a niche. So I'm curious, um, maybe give us a little bit of intro on like who you are and how you came to be the niche list niche person and how you became confident in that. It's so weird because like sometimes it's nicheless, sometimes it's anti-niche. I like the term meta niche because it's a little bit more broad. I find myself, I still technically have a niche, but my niche is polymathy, which is someone who has many deep, wide range of learnings and many deep learnings. So like Da Vinci was like really masterful level skills. Although you don't have to be a master at an area to be a polymath per se, just usually multiple deep ones. And that umbrella of sorts allows me to have multiple phases that I call them over the years. And I don't know how long these phases might be, but the point being, it's like, I'm focusing on one at a time, but also still having another one in the background kind of building out over time too. Mm -hmm. I don't just focus on one. It's interesting too, because I try to focus more on having a focus at a time, but sometimes your focus wanes. Sometimes you want to do other things. Like I was focusing on creating content on a daily basis. That was my goal. I created my Omni content series to be a daily series. I managed to make like four episodes before I stopped and realized I needed to tweak it. And then I ended up making like a fifth one a couple months later. And around that time is when COVID hit. And all of a sudden I started doing interviews because my podcast host created matchmaker.fm, which we matched on. And I was like the first like 30 people on there started matching with people. And from then on, I just started doing interviews on other people's shows, on my shows. And that became my next phase. That became my next hyperfixation was just like literally focusing on just doing all these interviews. So, so you actually, this is very, this is almost very like Joe Rogan. Like you've found that you can actually excel through your hyperfixation I, because mm-hmm. I get frustrated by my hyperfixation sometimes. Mm-hmm. Because I, I have trouble, like I go really deep into one thing. And sometimes before I even feel like I'm finished with that thing, I'm onto something else. Da Vinci had a lot of problems with that, where he would like not finish things. Like he was still working on a Mona Lisa at the end of his life, for example. And I think that there is a level of fighting that perfectionist in us. Mm-hmm. You have to be careful with that. Like you do want to try to finish things. I am a graphics designer as well. Like I created sprites for like video games or like I would edit them and stuff like that. And this is a hobby I've had since I was a kid. And yet I've rarely ever finished them. And so I I realized that like, I am a perfectionist still, I'm not going to release them until I'm like, at least most of the way done with them at the very least. But at some points you have to cut your like time and like finish it and just release it. And I've noticed that with like actual content that I'm creating, like blog posts and videos and audio casts and stuff like that. Sometimes I'm not fully 100% confident in it when I release it. But I feel like that's okay, especially when you're starting out, you need to just get content out there. And if you are nicheless, that's probably a good thing because then you get to experiment. And a lot of these big creators, Roberto Blake, Gary Vee, they all talk about like creating content like a hundred times, just getting good at it and learning because you have to practice. Like I mentioned, I did the Omni content four times before I realized, oh, there's a critical flaw in this pattern that I'm doing. I need to fix this system. Then I can move on. You don't know those problems until you've done it. Mm -hmm. What are your, what is everything that you do? Just yeah. so we can, cause I'm the same, I'm, I'm the same way. I have like a, a bunch of different things that I do. It's something I've always gone back and forth on where I'm like, oh, I feel like I need to, you know, figure, figure something out. But I've started to really realize that it's just, that's the way that I am. That's what I like. I like having like my attention in multiple different places. Um, so I'm curious, like in comparison, what are all the different things that you do? We should touch on the whole idea of like serial execution and like juggling. But in this case, like my juggling is that I do a lot of stuff in real life, but also just a lot of stuff online. I call myself an omni content creator after this idea of like omni channel content creation being everywhere. So I'm a video creator. I'm a podcast creator. I'm a blogger. I've been blogging for 10 years and video and podcasting for about half that. And then I've been on TikTok for a few years. So I have like 1200 videos on there. So I have content all over the board, all across the board, I guess you could say. 
And then on top of that, I was a swim instructor for the past decade, a personal trainer for the past few years, although not currently certified, but I've been doing it for so long, fitness instruction wise. I know what I'm doing. I know how to keep people safe. And more importantly, too, in my case, like I know how to keep myself safe when I'm doing my own stuff. And it's not important, more importantly, I guess to cut that part off, but importantly, like we can keep everybody safe. And the interesting thing is, well, I also run karaoke like every once in a while when they don't run it, like the main people do it, I do a lot of different things in town. I've had probably a dozen employers, half a dozen, no, half a dozen employers, two dozen roles at this point. So a lot of different things. Yeah. So you're, you're like, you, you kind of are like a jack of all trades. You, 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 you. Now, were you, were you always that way though? Like when you were a kid, did you struggle growing up with like being fit into a box? Like hmm. I think a lot of us are. Yes. There's a, there's like the putty tribe out there. Emily Watnick talks about it. Uh, my friend Perry Knopper, he has his octopus movements. These are people who like are like jack of all trades or multi potentialites, hands in all the different cookie jars. And since I was a kid, I've definitely been interested in many different things. Like I've been a gamer since I was 10. I started building computers around that time too, due to the help of my uncle. And then on top of that, I got into fitness really early on in my teenage years. And ironically, I was a really skinny guy. I was very like weak and I got picked on and I was like, I don't like this. I don't like being weak. I remember having like this friend. I mean, I kind of said her a friend, but he, they were kind of picking on me like when I was a kid and they were friends, but they were kind of those friends that would tease you. And I met him in like night. Like, he was in ninth grade. I was in eighth grade. We didn't talk after that because they graduated, moved on or whatnot. Then like years later, this is like a few years ago, I see them at the gym that I work at and he, he like realizes it's me and he's like texting one of our old friends. Like, you remember that kid we used to like tease a little bit? Yeah. Now he's ripped. I was like, okay, cool. Like, <laughs> it's kind of a nice little feeling. So I've done a lot of different things growing up. And when I was working, my favorite experience was when I was having like six rolls at once and getting pulled every which way. It was like, it was too crazy, but it felt fun. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. I can imagine that's challenging to be in. And I guess, where did you go to school? Cause what I'm thinking, like where I went to school, they wanted us to focus on, on one thing. They didn't really let us explore. It wasn't like mm -hmm. if I had a choice, I probably would have gone like more of a Montessori type approach. Mm -hmm. Is that like, is that kind of what you did? No. And like, I wish I kind of did like Montessori kind of got more popular way after I got out of school and whatnot. My little sister went to it for a short time and I thought that was interesting. And like, I've talked to people on my show about like European schools and even Chinese schools and how they're a lot more interdisciplinary, which I think is really cool. Like, they, like in a lot of European schools, like secondary school, like high school, they'll do like two big kind of focuses. So you'll be looking at history through the lens of science or vice versa or something like that. And then like Chinese schools really teach people to be multidisciplinary like music and like arts and video games and like doing all kinds of different stuff. I grew up just not caring as much. Like I was very, I was, a, I was a scholar at heart, but I was never much an academic, if that makes sense. Yeah, Love to fair. learn. Yeah. And I think that's why we all kind of get along here too. It's one of those things where like great minds think alike. But I remember some of my favorite experiences were being kind of anti-conformist where I just spend my time reading books. Like I burned through the philosophy section of my school library within a matter of months. Like at least the, the most interesting books at the very least. And then I got in trouble at one point during the summertime, there would be uh, these parts of the school that were blocked off. And my curiosity was set in. I was like, I want to see the school. Cause this is before the school year started. I hadn't actually got a chance to experience the school yet. This, is my, this happened two different summers. So I went to two different schools and I would just explore the blocked off parts of the school. And at one point I got caught by a teacher and he's like, yeah, you're not causing any trouble. Let's go, go on. But I was literally just curious and exploring the school, but it was like, that's how I learned was being able to explore. That's really funny. Are you now, I have a feeling that there's some sort of, I mean, there's lots of personality type quizzes and or personality type assessments. And I'm, I'm, I'm really curious, just like from what you've just said, have you ever taken the four tendencies quiz or the four tendencies framework? Are you familiar with that? I'm not familiar off the top of my head, but I feel like I've taken something similar or probably taken it at some point. So there's, there's like upholders, there's questioners, okay. there's okay. obligers and there's rebels. Hmm. And I, I have a very strong feeling that most people like us and people like you who have a tendency to like think outside the box and, you know, not really conform to any very specific thing. Like most of us are probably rebels, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that was a perfect example of like, hey, there's something that's uh, off limits right now. And I'm really curious, like I want to learn about that, um, but I'm not supposed to because I'm not supposed to go there, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> you, you like get in trouble. Yeah. So I'm really curious, do you now, do you, and have you had conversations with other people who are like you, that you notice similar traits or characteristics that people can start to pick up on earlier, either for themselves or for their mm -hmm. kids, if they're kind of worked and wired like this? 
So I, I want to make this distinction too, but because neurodivergence comes into mind as well. Yeah. Like a, a, at least a dozen of my interviewees, and I've done 96 interviews since May of 2020. So it's been a lot, but like at least a dozen of them had ADHD or have an ADHD. I mean, and it's one of those things where there's not a correlation, but there is kind of this relation between them. I think a lot of people who have ADHD or even some other neurodivergence, they tend to be polymathic by nature because you're putting your hands in a lot of different cookie jars. Being polymathic essentially is just indulging in your curiosity. And one of my guests really had this astute comment where he's saying that curiosity is a skill and you have to actually train it and work it. And people who are more rebels, people who are more ADHD too, like we're bound to do many different things because we're just indulging that curiosity more often. You're like rebelling against the conformity of focusing on just one thing, or maybe in the case of ADHD, you have all these different hyperfixations over and over again, serial, like you're doing one, then the next, then the next, but you're indulging in that. You're not letting yourself conform to the social standard, so to speak. Yeah. Do you, do you feel as though you had to learn the skill of controlling those urges and those curiosities? Mm-hmm. Yes and no. There's this, it's more of not like control. It's more of organizing. So if okay. you want to get really good at it, time management is kind of control. And I've been trying to learn that myself actually as of late. Once again, so I have learned it. I think now it's time to relearn it. But I created a system in Notion. I call it my poly innovation operating system just because it's one of those things where I'm trying to innovate multiple parts of my life, whether it's the mind, body, spirit, or emotions in the four pillars sense, or perhaps more in my content production sense. I'm trying to organize all that. Like even today, I made sure I put this podcast in my database in my Notion to make sure I keep track of it, keep track of the link if I need to share it again down the line, something like that. And so, yeah, having a system in place is what I was trying to say. That's something that I'm dealing with right now. Same. I've never done that. Dude, it, my it. shit is unreal. Like, I think I've always been like a high performer, you know, high energy, and I'm pretty good at keeping like a lot of things in my head. So I think I've used that like a crutch and like previous jobs, even um, through now, it's like, I just have a bunch of notes, like an either like handwritten notes or like a, a like a notes app. Um, and I'm getting to the point where I'm like, man, this is, this is draining. It's yeah. so unorganized. It's such a time waster. <laughs> and then once you start hiring people, it's like, an, it's like basically a deal breaker. Like you, it's basically impossible. To to yeah. Like if you're hiring a bunch of contractors and have a bunch of different projects going on and you're not, and you don't have like a legit management like process, I mean, that's just, that's a, that's a literal walking nightmare. And that's what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. And so, um, I just started trying to figure this out. Like I got like a software and stuff and just like, I've been, I've had to like hire like a consultant to help me figure it out. Cause I'm just, it's so not like where my brain goes. I don't know how the mm-hmm. software works. I don't know how to, or I don't even know how to begin like organizing things like what goes where I don't even know like how you keep track of this stuff. And so I've gotten like kind of like a, a coach that's like helping me with it. And just from like, one week of focusing on this, I'm, I've gotten like so stoked about it. I'm like, Oh my yeah. God, like I can see the light at the end of the ton- the tunnel. So I think like, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to say, but I think a lot of people don't do it. And my, my, like, I don't know. I feel like there's kind of two different types of people. There's the people who are like, here's the thing I'm going to go do. Let me get all my ducks in a row. And my, like my system set up and then I'll do that thing. And mm-hmm. then there's the types of people who are like, let me start doing that thing and I'll figure all of that stuff out later. Um, And I'm like very much that type of person. I'm just like, all right, let's start making money and like getting clients and then we'll figure everything out. So then it's like, well, you still actually have to figure it out at some point. You can't like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things too, where I, I moved all of my notes, even my physical, like written down ones into notion at one point. And that was a really nice lifesaver. But for example, since I was a kid, I started writing this like story for video game series I had in mind and I had it all written out. I, I put a lot of it into Evernote, but they were all, it, it was either in Evernote or in physical form. And none of it was in notion. None of those any way I could actually edit it or anything like that. And so I moved it all in there. I, I, I transcribed it myself by hand paper right here, typing it all out so I could get all the notes in there and I could actually start writing out the story about more. And I started expanding upon it, started doing more with it. And the real cut kicker with a system like that is having the slow burner effect. When you have all these notes and even if it's in various different databases and archives, when you have it in a same platform like Notion or Obsidian or Rome Research, then you're able to actually put it all together and you can start seeing the notes and how they connect. You can even reference them too, which is really nice. So you can have like references to notes that you've written down in the past. 
Yeah. Yeah. I would love to dive into this a little bit because this is something that I've personally struggled with quite a bit. And Mm -hmm. like even Travis, I'd love to hear what you're doing is just like Travis was saying, like I have notes everywhere. Like I have post-it notes. I have like multiple notepads. I just like, I, and my thing is, is I can write notes and reminders, but it's like the red ribbon on your finger. It's like, I'll see the note or the reminder. And I'm like, what was that supposed to be for? If it's not in front of my face, if it's not easy for me to access, then I will forget. So having a daily planner has been really helpful for me because I know to look in it. But if I just type notes in like my notes app on my phone, for example, I never, I will, like, they'll be gone. They'll lose, like I'll lose them. And so I need more structure. And I think a lot of people are this way in order to have them readily available. And so you're talking about, you've mentioned like Notion and Obsidian. I'm not familiar with these things. What, what are these softwares? So Notion in particular is the one I use and I, I, I'm a shill for it. So a couple of little side notes. There's a website called pickmybrain.world. It's a way you could like meet up people and whatnot. I try to go on there to help people out. So people can like book me to actually help them with their Notion. But Notion.so is an interesting tool where it's kind of like the all-in-one. You have Kanban boards, Gantt charts, databases, notes. Here's the real kicker that, that hooked me to it, right? I use Google Sheets. And one of the things that I was going to mention earlier is that I created my own do-it-yourself degree. Like you were asking me like, what do I do for education? That was what I did. I couldn't find a university degree that suited me. And I was like, okay, let's all these Coursera edX courses online. Let's find a way to organize those, structure those and pursue that. And I, ironically, I didn't even finish it per se before I started moving on to this whole concept. Like I realized, okay, this, this what I'm building here is way more helpful to other people. I created this list of 450 courses in a Google sheet. And I realized this, this doesn't work. Like I can't, I can't access anything. I can't find what I need to find. It's just, it's too there, it's too much there. So I moved on to Airtable. Airtable had a really cool system where you could collapse them into different groups. And I was like, okay, cool. That can make like semesters or something like that. And I started pursuing it a lot more that way because it was a lot more organized. I could get to the information I want to quicker. And that's where it's key, right? Eventually Notion came out and I, I tried it hated it at first. It, was, it felt clunky. I didn't know what to do with it. Turns out there was a couple settings that I needed to tweak and then I was able to use it again. But uh, I actually deleted my account. I was so like, I was like, whatever, I'm not doing it. I, uh, I looked at over like 90 different social media management tools. I looked at a whole bunch of content, uh, po- task management tools, project management tools. And I just, I made a whole list of them. I tried them all out. Notion came to my view. And when I tried it a second time, I was like, this actually is really powerful. You can create this kind of beautiful almost pyramid-like structure, a flat-like structure, whatever you want to go for. And it's like Lego. That's the best way to describe it. You can build whatever you want and build it out the system that you need. And so some people have taken old systems like the get thing done system or the para method, the second brain, and put it into Notion. A couple people like me and August Bradley, we built our <clears throat> we built our own systems up in Notion from the ground up and with that in mind. So Notion is more of like a Lego all-in-one productivity tool. Obsidian and Rome is more of like a knowledge platform where there's it's like a neural network, of it, if you will. So different tags will link together. So when you make notes, those notes can start automatically linking together. So it's very cool, but it's a bit different than Notion. Yeah, they're okay. basically, these are, these are all different softwares that a lot of them are like basically the same thing, but different styles of like memberships and billing that are kind of slightly better for different business um, like structures. The one I use is ClickUp. That's like one of the newer ones um, that mm-hmm. has like a ton of buzz in the like um, productivity world. So far I like it, but it's the same thing. It's like you get in there and I'll just kind of give my my viewpoint of it. Like you get in there and from someone like me, Josh, we're very similar in this way. And I'm just like, fuck this. Like immediately it's like, there's no way I'm going to figure this out. You know what I mean? And, and I realized that I'm like, all right, this, you know, it, it comes back to a lot of things that we're talking about. Same as, same as fitness. It's like, this is something that I literally need. There's no way I can continue like not doing this. I have no idea how to set this up. I have no desire to know how to do this. Like I need someone to help me. So I, and what's cool about a lot of these softwares is they have like consultants that you can go even like through their software or, on like Fiverr or something. And you can like pay somebody to like help you set this shit up. Cause for me, I, what I realize is like, it's not just the software. I have like a top down issue. Like I don't have like systems in place, you know? Um, I it's need, an information like, architecture. Yeah, yeah. Like I need, I need big picture down to the actual implementation. So what I have in my head ideally is I'd like to have like 
a co- kind of like a business consultant, I guess, to help me like get my processes set up and the, and the actual like software set up. And then probably like a virtual assistant to like implement a lot of it and like build it out. So like with, I'm just kind of like following along with this system. And then I have like a really good thing set up, but like ClickUp is the, is one that I really like. It works really well for what I'm doing. I've definitely used Airtable before, um, but there's a bunch of them. There's like monday.com is a really like marketed one. Um, and they're basically Sana. like, yeah, yeah. Asada or whatever it is. Um, and it's, yeah, it's basically like a software that's going to, um, that should be kind of like your be all and end all of managing your projects. And especially like working with like any contractors or pe- or people that are on your team that you're like delegating to. Yeah. I ended up having this issue where I didn't like clip up or click up or a lot of these other tools because of the levels of abstraction. So you're talking about like the big picture kind of top down. It has tasks and subtasks and kind of projects kind of count, but they didn't really. It was just being like two levels of extraction. I found that I really needed a couple more beyond that. I wanted to have as many as I wanted to, particularly for different databases. So I left ClickUp, but ClickUp was one of the few ones I really enjoyed. And they actually have gotten better since then. And Monday, surprisingly, got a lot better too. They got a lot of marketing since then, but I used ClickUp back in like 2017, 2018, when it was still kind of starting out. And uh, Monday has these automations like Zapier, where you can like automatically send an email when a certain things change to get someone to come in and do a task when they get that. And I think ClickUp has some similar stuff too, but yeah, ClickUp and Monday and Notion are like top three. Notion being top, but yeah. 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 And I would definitely, I mean, I would definitely suggest it. And what I would, what I would suggest is finding somebody to help you. Cause like, I think my opinion is like, this, this is the type of thing where like, all right, think if you think of yourself as a company, if you don't have like a, office manager and a like head of operations, like how's your company going to run? That doesn't make any sense. But like when you're working for yourself, you still need that shit. Like you still need somebody who's process or you still need like the processes. But if you're the like CEO sales and your brain doesn't work that way, it's like, how many years is it going to take you to like get that (laughs) set up? You know what I mean? Um, I think even with, it's like a, yeah, it's like a process getting like actually truly organized and things automated like even working with somebody, it's still going to take like months to get mm-hmm. everything like correctly set up. You know, it's not like something where you're like, Oh, let me set up the software and it works overnight, but um, it's super important. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I think, I think the thing that, I don't know, I don't know if it's something that I've struggled with or if other people have felt the same way is that I feel like I've haven't found something that makes sense to me organizationally. Like I, and, and maybe it's because like you said, Dustin, it just maybe what I was using needed a few tweaks before it made sense to me, kind of like you you did with Notion. And so I think you're you're right, Travis. Like having someone help to figure out what needs to happen in order for it to make sense, like in my brain, so that the organization that I'm using makes sense to me. I mean, I even think of guys like you, Travis, and and you know our friend Scott, who are videographers you know, being able to organize all of your clips, all of your photos in ways where you can easily find them. Like that type of organization is like so far beyond me and far there, but, but I know that there's a way that it could make sense. So the same thing goes here with the organization in our business structures, even in like the way we organize our computers, the way we organize our thoughts, our notes, our client load, that's, going to make you or break you. And like we've, like Travis talked about, like, if we want to continue to grow our businesses, that has to happen. Otherwise we're going to get stuck because our organization won't allow us to progress any further. We're going to like be at our workload capacity when we don't have to be like, we can handle more workload if we're more organized. Totally. So Dustin, you had just sent over a list of um, the top uh, task management softwares. Yeah. Um, We'll put that in the show notes. We'll too put that in the show everybody. notes. I just figured it would be useful because that's what caused me to really find Notion and all these and click up and all these tools. I literally, I, I would see all these lists and it would all be incomplete. I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm going to make my own. And this was one of my most famous posts on Medium before I left Medium. And I remade it on my, on my actual new blog. And it was one of those things where I was like, okay, cool. And actually, there was a lot more to add to it now that I remade it too. And especially since I started making my own system in Notion, I had a, had a section about that as well. And so this was one of the posts that I made just purely out of because I was like, I was digging through all these different tools. I might as well make a list about it too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And I'm looking through it right now. And I mean, a lot of what we talked about 
today, even just, you know, uh, is on this, but you do a really good job of breaking down um, like what each of these are, what it gives you, how it's organized. Um, this is really helpful. I, I'm going to dive into this and spend some time with this, but for the listeners, we're going to include this in the show notes. So if you're having trouble with your organization um, or if you feel like you're scattered, this is going to be a, a massive help. Yeah. It's a, um, it's a game changer. And, and it's going to be like a, cause this is what I'm going through right now. It's going to be a process. Like I, I think if you can do it, finding somebody to hire or even just like, you know, a mentor or a friend, even just for some advice, whose brain actually works this way. Even if you just know a friend yeah. and they're super organized, maybe like ask them what they do. Like, but um, if you can like hire someone to really help you implement this, I think that that is literally a game, like life changing personally, like just from what I've seen so far, I'm like, I can see like the vision of how it's going to change. There's a t- so many amazing softwares out there, you know, click the link in the bio for like this list from um, Dustin's website. Um, and this is, this is like, crucial for sure. Yeah, that's going to be what cool. else, what else is good for like, so it seems like organization is a huge theme for like someone who's a polymath or a jack of all trades. You know, um, if you are someone who's like, all I do is, you know, sales, I work in a sales organization. I just have the one job. That's all I do. Your company probably provides stuff like this. You just do one thing, you know, that's perfect. But for people like us who do like a lot of things and we're the ones in charge of it, like organization is key. What's, what else is our like top, like, so we've got these, you know, there's a lot of softwares, like what else would you suggest to people for like staying organized and being able to like improve their productivity? I think that a lot of people make this distinction of, okay, someone's a generalist, someone's a specialist and they need different organizational methods. They kind of do like you need something that can keep up with your divergent brain. If you're going to be someone like a jack of all trades, hands in all the different cookie jars. However, for the most part, it's a matter of just productivity and getting yourself to do it. So having reminders on your calendar, for example, are helpful is helpful. And then just on top of that too, just doing it. And one thing I've been doing lately is not what I need to be doing ironically. And the thing is, I've been kind of hitting a funk every winter. I get the like seasonal affective disorder. I was like, I get sad, you know, and I don't like the point in time it brings me down. And so now my productivity is going to be lower knowing your seasons, knowing your rhythms. That's I think is really key to everybody, regardless of your specialist or generalist. And one thing I want to mention before I wrap up this idea is this idea of sprints. And so for some reason, for me in particular, I know that a lot of people do this too. I think even specialists do too. Some people are going to be really, input oriented and other people could be really output oriented and then they flip flop. And then every once in a blue moon, like every quarter or something like that, you'll get one where you're doing both. And that's really fun. But like, for example, some weeks I'm literally creating like five blog posts in a day where I'm just like, I'm just in a creative mood. I'll, I'll schedule it out over the week and I'll just like be writing, 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 or drawing, 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 or creating something, whatever. Other weeks I'll be just sitting there consuming information. I'll be watching an hour long video straight with like two X speed and just consuming the information and just like learning it voraciously. And then like I said, the next week it flips. So knowing what week you're on, I think is what's really key. How do you know? Yeah. And, and, and going with the flow. So how do you know? And then how do you like, I feel like committing to that. I feel like there's a a lot of resistance sometimes of like, Oh no, but I feel like I should be doing this. I mean, there are some things you have to be doing. Sorry. I didn't know. It's It's like, sometimes you have to get something done. Like if you have a due date, for example, you're going to have to get that done. But, and I mean like the entire day might, might not be all learning. Although sometimes I am doing that. But I try to follow that flow, follow the dopamine as like, there's this TikToker who makes ADHD content and he's like following the dopamine I, all the time. I, I love that guy. I know who you're talking yeah. about. Follow yeah. the dopamine, baby. Yeah. Wish I remember his username so he could shout him out. Maybe you could like yeah. put a link in because he's really cool. He deserves it. But, um, and like, that's kind of what I'm doing. And so for example, okay, right. Here, here's what I've been doing the last few weeks. It's, it's, it's weird, but it's been working. Ironically, I, um, I collect a lot of stuff, right? I've always been a collector. You start being interested in a lot of different things. Sometimes you'll get in those little hyper fixations. You'll save a lot of videos in your playlist and then you'll move on. Right. So I had videos saved about game development or music development or exercise or whatever, what have you. And eventually I managed to accumulate 750 videos in my watch later playlist, just like in the past, like couple of years. And I was like, okay, I need to get through this. 
And so my goal was, I had two goals over the past month or so to get that watch later playlist down and then to rank up an apex. Cause I'm a gamer too. And the, the apex is the one of the few games I've actually been using as decompression. Ironically, it's kind of a stressful game at times, but it's one of the few things I'm interested in. And so like ranking up in there was a goal for mine. So I'm going to be playing it. I might as well have a goal. And then the other thing was getting that watch later playlist down. Now, all I'm doing is consuming content or reorganizing things. I, I moved some to a different playlist. I deleted some, I watched some, and eventually I got it down now to 35 videos over the past like month, 750 to 35. And that's because it's something I've been interested in and that's been helping me. And ironically, it's been helping me with content too, because there were some videos on that list that I saved purely so I could make content out of. Like I had a video I wanted to write about, for example, and it got me writing again and it got me starting to be more creative again. Mm-hmm. I like that. I think, I think it's, uh, you're, you're like hyper fixating. Now, when you're watching those videos, I guess here's a, here's an interesting question. Um, because we tend to be semi-divergent, right? When you're watching those videos, are you 100% present in watching those videos? Or are you doing other things while you're watching those videos? I spend a lot of time with productivity and as a lifeguard, our goal was to watch the water consistently, right? Like I, we would stare at the water for 30 minutes or whatnot. And you have to like scan the entire zone every 10 seconds. And that taught me focus. And I, it doesn't always keep in track. Like I was watching a video earlier and I was on my phone. I was watching one of your guys' interviews earlier and I got like halfway through it and then started looking at my phone. I put it down and went back to it. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you have to like bring yourself back. And it was an interesting video. Like I had to like make sure I, well, I had to at least listen to one episode before coming on. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And so like bringing yourself back is key. But Oh man, I lost my train of thought there. What else? Yeah. What else? Um, you, that was a really good point there. What else can we do to like train our focus? Yeah, mm. That's a good one. Cause I know one that has helped me recently. So I'm just wondering what you do. I usually use some kind of music. I, I, I like having a soundtrack to my life. It's one of those things that I enjoy. I also listen to binaural beats every once in a while. And that Same. might be so you're thinking of. Yeah. That's one. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I've, started meditating recently and been noticing like crazy, um, training a muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. pretty quickly been noticing like some pretty crazy, uh, improvements around, around like distraction and mood swings and stuff like that. Um, that's been, that's been cool. But I also like the binaural beats. It's a little weird at first because you're yeah. just like, where's the music? But like, is that like brain uh, FM? Yeah, essentially. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Although you gotta be careful. You're actually not supposed to listen to them too loudly. And a lot of people make that mistake. And if, and ironically, it can actually damage your hearing if you do it too loudly for too long. Cause you're meant to listen to them for like 30 minutes to an hour or something like that. And yeah. some people put it way too loud because they're like, oh, I can't hear it very well. But as long as you can subtly hear it, it'll start putting those subliminal like wave brave wave impl- like influences, if you will. Yeah, you're not supposed to here like it's not supposed to be the same experience as like listening to music but that's um that's one that's been on the huberman lab there's like now irrefutable scientific studies showing that it basically i think it's like one 1.5 to two times uh increases like human concentration it's a 40 hertz gamma binaural beats and i will put that link in the show notes as well Definitely do that. That would be super helpful. Honestly, it's like on any, Spotify. Anything, I'll send you a link to mine too. Cool. Yeah, please do. And like selfishly, anything to help me focus. Dude, I, as like a neurodivergent person, I I had a chiropractor appointment this morning. I, I got back and I got into the kitchen and I swear I started like six things and none of them <laughs> got done. Like the dishes were half put away. There was one like half washed cup, like breakfast was half made. And then I was like, shit, I didn't take my Adderall today. So, so like, so like anything to help me focus and stay focused long enough to finish a task is super helpful. Um, I, I do want to jump into Dustin's another link that you sent, which is super interesting to me because as we're talking about this organization type of environment, I'm thinking of like the way that I know Travis organizes his video clips and his photos. And then there's the way that I organize my computer, which is kind of like, not at all really mm, it's it, like a it, dirty it, clothes hamper. It Ugh. seems like not at all. Like I, <laughs> like I have folders, but I don't think there's really any sort of structured architecture to it. So you, Josh's, just- Josh's desktop looks like it was organized by Salt Bay, where he's just like sprinkling <laughs> just folders. There. A yeah. little <laughs> bit of something everywhere. And then every now and then it gets too overwhelming. And I like 
I group things that are kind of similar into folders. And then I probably like half of them, I probably never see again. So you, you sent this link about <laughs> how you organize data, how you visually visualize using your computer um, yeah. and the idea behind structuring your workflow and your data. So can you tell us a little bit about how you do this so that I can learn? Yeah. I, it, it's not something I am easily able to teach because it's not something I talk about very much. I made that blog post purely because I was like, I'm so sick and tired of thinking about this. And like, no, no one talks about it. It's so freaking frustrating. Okay. This Gary V talks about like a, this should be a class in school. I yes. yeah. like Y equals 100%. MX plus B is fucking useless to me, but how to organize your computer would be mm-hmm. an amazing class. So I think there's two things I want to mention here. I want to mention Notion again. Like I was going to ask to share my screen so I could show you my yeah. like system, at least the broad of it. And then the other thing would be this idea like clouds and dirt. Gary Lee talks about clouds and dirt, macro and micro. And that's how I visualize my computer. And it's also how I visualize my Notion system. And this idea of the big picture and little picture, what are you doing on a day to day? Like what do you need access to quickly? What do you access to over the broad sense? And for example, one of my main principles is a clean desktop. Mm-hmm. Like, like one, maybe two items on there. And that's it. The two things, the two things I have on my desktop right now is the recycling bin. And that's only because that's like the only place you can actually have it. I would love having it in my like taskbar if I could really, I kind of can, but not really. So I leave that there. And the other thing is apex. And that, and that literally gets deleted almost like every month. And then they'll come back when it gets an update or something like that. But like, that's the only two things I have on there. The rest of it's all f- put away in like folders. Mm-hmm. Yeah. My so, desktop would give you a panic attack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> ask me, ask me a question to kind of like, how do you, how do you want me to explain it? Do you want to uh, share, would it be beneficial to share your screen? Yeah. I, yeah. Really I think this up. I, I opened up screen share options, so you should be able to share, but I think that would be cool. And then yeah, to people who are listening uh, to the audio, y'all can find <laughs> this on YouTube and we can actually see like how Dustin organizes his computer, which is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for me personally, can be sick. when I like, I hear things like this, like, you know, how to get productive and stuff. And it's just like, it's so my natural state is like Josh's uh, desktop. <laughs> That's my natural state, but it's just like, I just can't, you know, I can't do it anymore. But so it, it's hard for me. Like I need to see it. So I think yeah, this is super too. beneficial. If someone has a good system, it's almost like I'm a quick learner. It's like, if you just kind of walk me through something visually, sometimes I'm like, oh mm-hmm. shit, yeah. that's, that's how I'm supposed sense, to be doing right? it. Yeah. Honestly, so. I don't need to even show you that much. I just wanted to give you kind of a picture of like the simple structure. Like this is, this is it right here. And what we're looking at is the system of the big picture down to the small picture. So people listening in, I'll try to be verbally descriptive. I love the eight terms macro and micro. And I was like, okay, what can I do to expand that? And here's one of the things that kind of psychology goes into our brain loves threes. We love chunks. We love chunking things, especially people who are neurodivergent, I think as well. I don't remember the exact science behind it, but we love chunks. And so I was saying, okay, what kind of system can I do in three? Like input, slow burner, and output. That was the kind of idea. It's kind of the get things done mentality. And I also kind of was influenced by the second brain para method. Diego Forte t- uh, talks about it. And that's having like projects, areas of interest, resources, and archives. And I don't really care for that system as much either, but it was influenced by that. Okay, so you have inputs. You're building it out and you have output. But what about your self-development? What about your overall aspects of life too? So you have the supra. So I found a scale. Like, let me get back up a little bit. I found a scale for a lot of science terms. You have supra, macro, meso, micro, nano, and pico. And these are just like a scaling system. That's all I wanted was a scaling system to scale out this idea that I had in mind. So I have supra, which is the yearly planning and review. I have the preview, like, okay, I'm going to plan out the year ahead. And then I have the overall like review and I I need to get better at doing the review part of it where I'm reviewing the end of the last year. But essentially speaking, you take in what, what did I do? Right. What did I do wrong last year? And then try to preview the next year and plan it out. What am I going to do each quarter? That kind of thing. Then you have the quarterly, the macro, the quarterly, which I consider to be more of the philosophical esoteric aspect where I guess it's not loading very well, but I have my four pillars and Ikigai alignment. And so I don't know why it's not loading there, but I'll explain it. The four pillars is a philosophy I created to kind of modernize a lot of older philosophies. I mentioned it earlier, the mind, body, spirit, and emotions. These are the four areas of your life that are going to be impacted in some way, shape, or form. 
we're fit people here the strength of struggle podcast your strength in, internally and strength intrinsically as well and having your body pillar for example built up it's going to help your health it's going to help your mental health as well we obviously know that part the mind is another aspect like learning and training it we talked about binaural beats earlier the mind body connection is always very strong anyways but a lot of people neglect the other two the emotions pillar for example having the emotional awareness of how are you feeling how are you feeling in this state how is that person making you feel can you empathize with that other person that kind of thing emotional intelligence Finally, you have the spirit pillar, which is one of those things where, okay, you have your spirituality that could be religious. It could be not. I like to see it as the bridge between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. And that way you can have this overall holistic system and keeping track of that. Again, this is not loading. I also don't want to drone on and on too. Like, but the next thing is the goals, projects, and phases. I really wish this would load. This one's really interesting. Okay, cool. I guess I'm kind of exposing myself a little bit here, but I have my goals here get to the thousand subscribers on YouTube, upload content for 60 days straight. That was a goal I started at the beginning of the year. And I failed at that because I was one of those things where I was in a creative, I wasn't in a creative state. I couldn't get to myself to doing it. Organize the phases for Poly Innovator, as well as having some projects. Nice little system there. We can talk more about that maybe the next time or something like that. Next one down, weekly habits. Are you actually keeping up with your brushing your teeth, keeping up with your workouts, keeping up with your learning, keeping up with your content? The next one here is the input and output. That is the modular degree inputs and then personal branding output. That's, I'm going to keep it there because otherwise I'll go on a whole tangent. Time blocking. And then you have like, I have some notes here because when I make the template, I don't want people to get too confused. And then the archives, like, okay, what do I have in the past? That's yeah, the for, gist of it. For anyone who's just listening, basically what he described is like, um, I believe that would be like a board chart where mm-hmm. there's, you know, you're looking at like a screen and there's like, blocks that go from left to right. And what he's going is from like super big picture all the way down to like the super micro zoomed in picture of like what's going on in his life, big picture. What, what are the four pillars he cares about down to what is he doing daily? Um, and this is a way of like organizing and keeping track of everything, tracking your progress. For me, mine's like a lot more, a lot more like task focused because my main thing is bringing like I hire, I have editors that work for me that are taking hundreds of gigabytes of information and turning them into hundreds of edited videos. And it's like, a you know, it has to be very, there has to be a process. You know, I can't have to like go into a bunch of different messaging things to message people every time anything changes it needs to be automated. And so these softwares can be like completely customized based mm-hmm. on whatever it is that you do. Um, but I yeah. want to touch on that actually, because like the, I have a master task database as well that helps link all those different areas too. So if I have a task I want to do to help with my body pillar, for example, or a, a task to go learn this particular thing in my modular degree system that I created, or a task to create content, it could all be funneled into that master task database. It's all linked to that, and that's where I think is key too. That's awesome. Yeah, that's um, super important. This seems super helpful. I'm like <clears throat> thinking about the application for my business. And, and like my life, not just my business, but like you said, you have these four pillars. Oh. Business is one of them. And um, this would definitely help. Like if organiza- organization leads to progress, like if you are organized, then you know what you're supposed to be doing and when. And especially for people like us who are kind of all over the place a little bit, like we need a little bit of structure. That made a lot of sense in my brain. I'm excited. Like an anchor. About that. Hmm? It's like an anchor for you. And I also yeah. want to mention too, that, that, picture that I just showed you to share with the video. That's the main system, but there's still a, a couple of templates like the modular degree or the content system that I created. These are all templates that I'm going to be releasing hopefully in this next year or six, next in six months, even too. So people can actually copy it and modify it for their own needs. So what are, what are the pros and cons of these two different lifestyles? Finding, finding a niche, which is what mm. everybody says to do versus not finding a niche. What are, uh, yeah. What are like the pros and cons and how do you know which one you should do? I think it's interesting too, because I've been really toying with this idea of micro niches. So my phases that you might've saw in that video there, I have like the first phase, which is modular degree. The second phase ended up kind of becoming this interview stuff I've been doing. Next phase after that, it's like, I'm going to do more exercise content because that's my background. And each one of those are niches, right? Interviews are not really niche per se, but like the, the education and the exercise, those are two niches that I can double down on. And I'm debating in my head, 
should I create just one YouTube channel and have it all on there? Or should I have multiple channels and that kind of thing? I really hate that concept. I actually argued a little bit with Roberto Blake on like Twitter about this and even some other creators where they were all talking about how, let's say you have your YouTube shorts. I saw on your channel, you guys have YouTube shorts and it's like, okay, cool. They're doing a new feature. It's going to help them out. But, and you guys do it tastefully. You don't have too much. You don't have too little. And it's one of those things. So tip of the hat to you guys. Uh, you. It's one of those things too. A lot of these big creators are creating separate ass channels for these shorts or separate channels for their clips or separate channels for the long form versus short form content. And I think that's stupid because it's one of those things where people are coming for you. I get why they're doing it because some people are going to be like, okay, it's cluttering up the feed or perhaps if you don't have it good enough organized playlist wise, it can make it hard for people to actually find the content they want to do and they're going to leave. So retention based, that's why they're doing it. So if you're going to specialize either in general, like niche wise or perhaps on the content format wise, specialization, niching down, that's kind of a helpful way to get more SEO, search engine optimization. Mm -hmm. But you also want to follow your own gut. And for me, my Poly Innovator channel is my personal brand. It's about me. It's about what I can do for other people. It's about the content that I'm creating. And I already have a few different phases kind of going simultaneously right now anyways. I have my content creation niche, if you will. Content repurposing is another thing I've been talking a lot about. Exercise is something I'm dipping my toe into now, even though I should have been done it a long time ago. And then on top of that too, the foundation that I built it off of, which is the education, modular education. So I had these different slow burners going on as well, but it's all part of the same ecosystem of Poly Innovator. And that's what's true to me. And I think that's what's more important. So you got to figure out what's important to you and then try to go off of that. Yeah, I think for for someone like you, that that makes perfect sense. Like you are, your brand is the Poly Innovator. So it would make sense that, the things on your channels are a little bit more diverse. Whereas, you know, for, for, for me, as, as I'm, I'm, I'm mainly, my business is mainly in fitness. Um, obviously we have the podcast and I have my toes and other things just personally of things that I enjoy doing, but my social pages are just fitness. And I've always been told like they should stay just fitness, but of course for you, it makes sense. Like people follow you because of all of the things that you do. So you probably get a lot of polymaths that follow you and, and want to learn from you and want to understand how you organize your brain and how you continue to stay structured and in, in what you're what you're doing and, and learn from a lot of different things. So that makes a lot of sense. I think it almost seems like if you're going to be without niche, then that has to be your niche. Yeah. Yeah, it's like my umbrella. So my my umbrella of polymath, it gives me the excuse to talk about many, many different things. That's yeah. what I go for. But you also got to realize too, you're not technically locked into it. So yes, you started out just as exercise, but you can divert. There is a YouTube channel, uh, Low Spec Gamer, really cool guy. He's been creating a lot of content around like turning down games to like the lowest possible they can be so they can run on really crappy hardware, really slow and like tiny hardware. These little mini laptops, for example. And it was a really unique niche but nowadays games are getting so complicated that you can't actually modify them nearly as much like Skyrim. You could play with for days and make it look really crappy, but at least you could actually play it on like a little laptop. And, or like I've seen doom on a little calculator, for example, like this kind of like unique niche. He came out like a couple months ago with a couple of videos saying like, he's done with that. He's gotten to the point now where he can't really make content like that anymore. He's not really interested in making more content like that. He wants to branch out a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And although I was sad, cause that's what I followed him for. I was like, you know what? I trust it. Like the way he creates content is really good. He's a, a cool person. I'm going to keep following him and see where he goes. He's branching out. And so he's taking control of the situation, even though he's going to lose some people who are no longer interested in his new things. He's going to make more people interested just because he's being true to himself down the line. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. You're, you're talking, you're talking a lot about um, creating content and I get the idea that, you know, you've been doing this for a long time, obviously. What are some recommendations that you have for people who are maybe a little bit less certain of themselves, maybe a little bit newer to creating content, maybe you're just trying to figure out who they're speaking to. What can you say to those people? I mean, I was like that too. I'm a very gregarious person. I like to talk. I'm sure you guys can tell. And it's one of those things where, I had a really hard time being comfortable on camera. I don't know why I was blogging for a long time. So I was used to my like words being out there. And then I started podcasting as well for a little bit. So I was getting used to my own voice. That's a big deal. Like yeah. literally just getting used to your own voice. And here's a little tip for that. The reason why it sounds so weird in the recording is because your bone conductions, when you speak, make your sound to yourself deeper than it actually is. So when you hear the recordings, it's not as deep as you're normally hearing it. So that's why it sounds off. The same thing kind of happens with video. I tried structuring my stuff with a script. 
And like, I could not do it. I feel like you might be the same way, Josh. I could not yeah. do a script no. and maybe a teleprompter, but that would be way too expensive right off the bat. So I started doing more free foam, a little bit more bullet points and keeping it there. I have an issue of going on tangents, which I probably did a couple of times in here, but it's kind of the structure of the show. It's a little more free form. Yeah. Am I able to go, go with it, go with the flow? But I had to learn that by doing it. And that's the kind of big thing earlier. I mentioned earlier too, making a hundred videos so you can learn what did you do right? What did you do wrong? Same with doing reps in the gym, right? You have to learn what you did right with your wrists, what you did right with your shoulders. Are you having good posture? I was doing pull-ups for a long time before my friend told me to pinch my shoulder blades together and get that better form aspect. I was like, okay, I didn't even realize that. Small details like that, you learn by doing it. So even if you don't have a niche or you do, you still got to put in the reps. Yeah. And you just have to get comfortable on, on camera, comfortable putting content out there. And eventually mm-hmm. I think you know, you can go, you can do exercises. You can go through different sorts of uh, exercises to get really clear on who you're talking to. Like you are very clear and comfortable and confident that who you're talking to are people who are other poly mass, other poly innovators, people who are interested in a lot of things. And you're clearly an expert on that. So I think as you continue to create that content, you should get more comfortable with the idea that you're speaking to the right people. The I think the one thing that everybody runs into is the little bit of imposter syndrome that kind of starts to creep in. And so have you experienced that? And what are, what are your thoughts on that? On overcoming that? Make it to you, make it really. I mean, that's one of those things where it's like, (laughs) uh, but no, it's, it's a serious thing. And I'm not trying to be negligent on that. And one that little tip too, like just even right now, like I want to look at you guys while we're talking, but in order to make this video look better for a viewer, I'm looking at the camera. And so it's one of those things where, I, I wasn't necessarily being myself when I was looking down here, like when I was making recordings, I wasn't necessarily being myself right off the bat. When I started making videos, I was kind of feeling like an imposture. Like I'm pretending to be like one of those fancy YouTubers by looking at the camera, but by doing that, I got more comfortable with it. Pretending there's a face behind there and like talking to that or something like that. And by having that thing until you make it mentality, by pretending a little bit, you start becoming that person over time. I did that with karaoke, for example. I love to sing, but I didn't know how to sing very well, like professionally or like that. I've been going for eight years now. That was one of my self-development endeavors was to teach myself how to sing. But the I'll, but more importantly than that was to be sociable, be that charismatic guy. I might have natural charisma by nature, but it's not something that can be skillful. I had to like fake it till I made it at that point. I had to be like, okay, I feel confident in the situation because I think I am kind of thing. And eventually I got more comfortable. I went last night even, and it was one of those things where like, I feel comfortable now. It's not faking it anymore. I became that person. And that's something that took time. Mm-hmm. Put yourself in the position and become the person who's in that position. Don't mm-hmm. figure out how to become that person who's in the position and then get in the position. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Put your mind's in the right place. Yeah. yeah. Like, like do what the person, do what the person you're imagining would do in that position. Yeah. And then become like, that be, person, become yeah. that person, do what they would do, adopt the habits, the identity of that person. You, yeah. you guys know the uh, Dosa Keys guy, the yeah, world's most yeah. interesting man. Oh, yeah. Stay yeah. Thursday, he, my friends. He used to yeah. live in, he lived in Vermont. We, Travis and I met in Vermont <laughs> really? and used to see him every now and then he was at like, really? Chinese, I think he came to Travis's job one day at China That's- Express, didn't he? I, not when I was working there, but it could have been Scott. <laughs> I heard that he came to your China Express one day. <laughs> I would not That's be hilarious. surprised. Yeah. No, I was watching videos about him and he was talking about how he prepared for that role and like what's come of it since then or whatnot. And I was like, I love the swagger and I love the like creativity of those commercials. And so I tried to channel that world's most interesting man when I go out. And I mean, I'm not necessarily the world's most interesting man. I haven't fought bears and like the polar ice caps. I haven't necessarily wind skied or anything like that. But if you can try to channel that kind of mindset, it's if there's actually a psychological term priming, I think it is where you like you watch a couple of videos of that person, like Reiner Reynolds or something like that, and try to be more charismatic or witty like he is. And then you can use that priming and try to emulate that when you go out or something like that. Mm. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And like, I mean, to get an idea of what that person would do and then you just mimic that. Well, I got one more story. Hold on. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I've, been, I've been telling the story lately, but uh, I went to the store with my mom the other day. Cause she was like, okay, I'll just get you some groceries. And I was like, yeah, sounds good. And we both like go in our separate ways. We're both kind of chatty. And this really cute woman comes up and she's like been older than me, but me and my mom, both chatty. We both talked to her. We're all three getting carts. And we all three go our separate ways. And I go to the back and like one of the back aisles and she was there. The woman was, my mom was like way over there. And, um, 
I, was, I took her to the store and like eventually I saw this woman and I was like, oh, are you following me? And she got a little laugh. And there's a Ryan Reynolds quote from the movie Van Wilder that I just absolutely love. And I try to use it as much as possible. And I'm just like, are you stalking me? Because that'd be super. And <laughs> And you gotta, you gotta use that little tonality that he does too. And like the facial expressions or whatever. And it killed. And she was like, she just, she giggled. And it, was, it was a nice little conversation after that. And eventually she went to go finish uh, shopping. I was like, okay, whatever. But it was a nice way in. It was like a nice feeling or whatnot, but I was able to channel that Ryan Reynolds energy. Channeled your inner Ryan Reynolds. Yeah. I think, uh, and I think like realistic, we realistically, we, we've all done that. <laughs> realistically, realistically, we've all done that. Especially like in college when we're obsessed with like movie quotes and like we would we would do that uh, whether or not we knew it like subconsciously we would you know have a few drinks and then just like be that person and maybe we forget to do that as we grow up as we turn into adults but like that's a that's a strong powerful skill yeah that's what you said there is pretty powerful too though i think imposter syndrome also comes out too because we're the societal expectations we think we're not meeting those expectations but those expectations are just constructs by other people right yeah. steve jobs talked a little bit about it as well um i don't remember the exact quote he was talking about but he was saying that like everything around us was built by people just like you and me the pencil and the computer everything else like everything you see was built by somebody and so there's there's no reason to like glorify these people too much like i love Leonardo da vinci he's my hero he's been my hero since middle school but he's also just a human being like he was just someone who had like a weird brain he acted differently and he acted upon that curiosity so just like i mentioned earlier curiosity is a skill and being confident in yourself and your abilities is also a skill too Mm -hmm. yeah and one that can be practiced and refined so continue to practice and refine man this has been an awesome conversation I'm, and I, it went exactly the way i thought it was going to which is kind of <laughs> all over the place but like really powerful in every single thing that we talked about i mean i learned a lot travis i'm sure you feel the same way so i hope our listeners did too um but Dustin, before we take off, I know our listeners are definitely going to want to learn more about you, find you, find your blog, uh, continue to follow you. I mean, this was incredibly helpful and in, on its own. Um, so I know I'm going to want to learn more and our listeners are too. So before we part ways, I would love you to kind of just leave our listeners with like some final words of wisdom and then also give yourself the plug. Like, where can we find you on Instagram, socials, your blog, everything? Yeah, thank you. So something I've been thinking about this entire episode is that when I have fun episodes like this, like I've been on like 60 podcasts, I've had 96 on my show. Every once in a while, we'll get an episode of just like random situations like this where I get to expel that polymathy and like actually have a good experience with it, right? We're touching all these different topics, but we're also kind of linking them all together. And so my thought process throughout this whole episode is like, how can I link back to this other topic from before? And those little link backs, the little, almost like SEO kind of thing, those little link backs, backlinks, they're really ways of bringing it all together and coming full circle. And I love that. So I love having that experience with you guys. So thank you for being able to do that with me. And if you want to find me, Poly Innovators is my name online, just one L. And you can find that on basically every platform. I like to challenge people to find me on like any platform you can think of. I'm probably there at least to some capacity, even like blockchain, social media platforms. And, uh, but more importantly, I think for your audience is my blog. And so there's a couple of posts I sent you that I think will help a lot of people, but I have a lot of random posts like that, where I talk about topics that no one else talks about. And I think if you just explore the 250 something blog posts I have on my site, you'll find some kind of treasure. I wrote a blog post like literally last week about Kung Fu Panda and the philosophy and the four pillars and that kind of thing. It's just one of those things where I was like that it, I was really motivated to do so. I think that's going to hit a lot of people in the right way. I love that. And I think it's uh, the super valuable stuff that you're putting out and stuff that we wish we learned in school and we didn't. So we have to learn it now. And it's great that people like you are putting information out there to help us learn it. So I really appreciate you, Dustin. This has been a phenomenal conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Like you said, we don't always have like these super fun, amazing conversations, but when we get to, it makes this a really fun job. So I appreciate you, man. Thank you for coming on. Thank you everybody for listening and taking another time, uh, some time to listen to another episode of the Struggle to Strength podcast. We will see y'all next week.